families we're getting, um, cases of death flying all around us. I don't know who's going to remain in the nation that will be talking about democracy and corruption. But on flip side today, we're going to talk about cultivating safety. We're going to cultivate in safety culture for nation building. Cultivating safety culture for nation building. We're going to cultivate that safety culture for nation building. I have a safety trainer here, uh, a safety professional, whichever way you're going to see him. Someone you've seen here before on the grounds of Red Cross, but he's also a trainer and he's also a safety expert. So he's going to talk to us on this. But we'll go on a break quickly. Let's deal on it's about you, Pod Belly. When we come back from that break, you'll meet my guest and we'll begin to talk about cultivating safety culture for nation building. We'll be right back. Belly fat is an excessive fat in the abdomen and around the stomach. It looks odd when you wear tight clothes and causes embarrassment. In fact, it's difficult to lose flaps from the belly region. Many people try to lose belly fat by eating less or famishing themselves, which is not at all a good idea and may result in several harmful side effects. The worst part is that the dream of getting flat and slim stomach remains elusive even after taking exercise and a healthy diet because we, out of sheer ignorance, make many mistakes which shatter our dreams of getting a flat stomach. But worry no more. The heavy way to trim down your tummy is to use natural home remedies. The first thing to do is to change your feeding habits. Banish all junk food from your diet and stick to a healthy diet. Junk foods like pizza, burger, noodles, processed food and fast food like soft drinks, fries and pastries have a high caloric value and are too unhealthy. Reduce sugar intake, beers and carbonated drinks. They cause blotting. So, for getting flat stomach, you have to stay away from them. Reason being that most junk foods are laden with high amount of processed carbohydrates and sugar, the main cause of bulging and fat tummy. Banish all junk foods from your diet to lose weight from the stomach and to get a flat tummy. Now that you have banished junk from your diet, replace them with healthy food and vegetables. We can't afford to make you hungry. Eat more raw foods like fruits. You will find that they are so much tastier and satisfying than cooked food. It detoxifies the body, makes you feel light and healthy, and over time you won't even feel like polluting your body with unhealthy food. Let your diet include watermelon because it contains 82% water which helps your stomach not to crave for food. Watermelon is rich in vitamin C which is beneficial for health. Cucumber also could be included. It contains 96% water and 45% calories. Add cucumber in your diet as a salad or eat raw cucumber to get a flat tummy now. Avocado is another useful fruit for burning excess fat. Avocado is rich in fiber and monounsaturated fatty acids. Use avocado to replace margarine and butter. Another thing is avoid fried foods. But if you must fry your foods, go for oils with high concentration of monounsaturated fats MUFAs like soybean oil and olive oil. Let your diet include nuts rich in fiber like walnuts, peanuts and almonds. Still talking about your feeding habits. Stop eating late at night as it causes accumulation of fat around your belly. Try to eat at least 2 hours before you go to bed to keep the stomach fat away. Avoid overeating. Large meals put a lot of load on the stomach and intestine. It reduces your digestion. Chances are that a lot of food will be stored as fat instead of used for energy, especially if you are not physically active. Eat slowly and chew each muscle well. It will control the amount of food you take and make you feel satiated early. You must follow this tip to lose fat from your belly and get a slim flat stomach. Away from your feeding habits, drink lemon juice. Lemon juice on a daily basis will definitely reduce belly fat soon. Add lemon juice in a glass of water, a pinch of salt, garlic and ginger. Stir it well. Drink this every morning in order to reduce belly fat. 
Green tea works as a detoxifier which helps in burning the excess body fat. Consuming green tea daily will also make your skin glow as well as make your tummy flat. You should also drink plenty of water. Water helps in reducing weight. Drink at least 8 glasses of water a day. This will not only flush the fat but also make your skin shiny and glowy. Your hair will become healthy. In fact, your whole body will become radiant. After doing all these, you can take exercise to reduce stomach fat and tone up the abdominal muscles. Taking exercise is the best way to turn up your stomach muscles and lose weight quickly. There are several sets of exercise that will help give you a flat tummy and a toned up ab. Exercises like squats, sit-ups, dancing, crunches, and running on a treadmill. Or better still, contact a gym instructor. Don't forget, your feeding habit is the major cause of pot belly. Change your feeding habit and see a positive result. Your body is your responsibility. Take good care of it. <laughs> okay, so someone that just watched this documentary and sent a message that he has taken lemon and it didn't work. Okay, it does work. Lemon is a, a serious fat burner, but you know, in this issue of health, um, weight loss, and maintenance, you must combine two things, must, like you have to eat clean, and then you need to exercise. So I'm like going to ask that person, how often does he work out in a week, and then how often does he eat clean? Do you consume alcohol? After taking like two bottles of beer, you go take one lemon and you think it's going to work. It's not magic now. So it takes um, a combination of eating clean. If you watch the full documentary, you see the part where you say, um, swap your unhealthy drinks for healthier drinks, swap your unhealthy fatty starchy foods for healthier foods and all of those things is a, is a process. <laughs> okay, so back to what we're talking about today, safety culture for nation building. Nigeria 59, we need to build a safe nation for the children who are coming. I have Organite Diri Wigo in the house and he's a safety um, trainer, safety expert, safety professional, safety, 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 everything. <laughs> Welcome to Flipside once again. Yeah. All right. So we're talking about safety culture to mark Nigeria's birthday. Mm. But what exactly is safety culture? Okay, so it's, it's, it's interesting that we're discussing this at this time. Uh, safety culture is an approach we take, the idea behind how safe we are. Um, the, the mentality of consciousness. So it's, it's a behavioral thing. There's, there's what we call behavior based. Yeah. So basically, you cannot be talking about safety or safety movement or safety ratio without the safety culture. So it's the approach we take and the way we view safety that determines what safety culture is. Okay, I'm going to stop you there. I will take a break quickly. We need to sort out something quickly, quickly. So we'll be back. Don't go. We just started. Or to lose flaps from the belly region. Many people hereby invite application from suitably qualified candidates for admission into his joint university's preliminary examinations board JUPEB program for 2019-2020 session. The program leads to the award of JUPEB certificate, which enables successful candidates gain direct entry admissions 200 level into Ibonija University, Okada, and other JUPEB affiliated universities in Nigeria and abroad. Method of application. Application forms should also be completed online through our university website www.jupeb.iuokada.org edu.ng under admission. Candidates advised to follow the application instructions very carefully and ensure they select the correct subject combination. Application fee is 10,000 naira only payable to Assex Bank. Account number 078-707-7169. Account name IUO Jupeb. Lecture begins September 24, 2019. For more inquiries, please call 0803-433-1960 or 807 207 2611 Email jupeb at iuokada.org Edu.ng. Announcer, Dr. Edwin Okoro, Registrar. Generator fumes are gases ejected from the engine of a part generating set as waste products. The big question is, would you drive your car into your house and leave it running? It only makes sense that you should never run a generator inside your house either. Cause, like cars, all power generating sets give off carbon monoxide 
which is a poisonous, odorless, colorless, and very deadly gas. So, never ever run a portable generator indoors or in a partially enclosed space, including your kitchen, garage, bathroom, toilet, or even if you use fans or open doors and windows, because you could end up dead. This is a safety message from independent television and radio. of safety generator generator films all around we don't have light in a dose state in Benin City particularly and so we're talking about safety 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 and at night first of all you can hardly hear your neighbors because everyone's generator is turned on then let's not even start talking about the carbon monoxide that's another matter entirely so we've established before now that safety culture is a way of life it's not just something you wake up and you talk about safety once and you're like, okay, I have safety culture. You need to work hard at it. Okay, so but what does a, a safety trainer or a safety professional do? Okay, so basically, safety is a profession. Mm. It's, even though it's still an evolving profession here in Nigeria, it's more advanced in other parts of the world. The safety professional is that person who is, is, is a bridge between uh, those who are administering an area and the other persons who are responsible or are subject to the administration of those who are administering. So the safety trainer drives safety to, is the implementer of safety policies. Mm. So basically if you have a company and the management make policies for that company, the employees are supposed to work in line with the policies that are made. So the safety professional is in the middle between management and the employees to ensure that management is not losing and the professionals are not at risk. So the safety professional is that person who ensures that you are safe. Uh. So he's, he's pretty much the supervisor of work, he's the implementer of policies, he's the one who takes charge to ensure that things work well and there are no, he reduces the risk, the loss, the hazards that are present. That are, even though safety is everybody's business, but somebody has to take responsibility and be at the forefront in that. Uh, but, but how well do Nigerians patronize safety experts? Well, like I said, it's, it's evolving, uh -huh. right? So it's not where it should be, that much I can agree. But I think we're getting there slowly. And again, that will take us back to safety culture, which is why to a very large extent, some of us are advocating, even what I'm doing right now is, is part of driving home safety culture, because we're going to talk about, I can't live here and not talk about certain important things. Um, we are trying to ensure that persons are more aware. I think that's where it starts. Mm. The awareness to the hazards, awareness of the risks that exist, maybe in where you work, how you've been doing a thing before. For instance, I give you a certain uh, thing, ergonomics, matching people to work and ensuring that they do that safely. A lot of people, when they want to pick a thing from the floor, they just, from the way they're standing, they flex their back and their waist and just reach down and pick that thing. And at the, at the, at the end, you find that over time, they complain about how they have back aches, lumbago, waist pain, things in that nature. Whereas we're told that the best way to bend, if you're going to bend to the ground, is to flex your knees. You understand? So, but these are things that the safety professionals, we need to raise awareness about. We need to continue to drive home those messages because it's a culture, it's a, it's a behavior. So we must sound that message such that it begins to ring in people's heads. They realize, like in those days when we were in nursery school, they would tell us, there were songs we used to sing. If you want to, if you want to uh, cross the road, you look left, right, and uh, uh, left again. And then green light says stops, red light says this. Oh, oh. Green light okay. says <laughs> Red light says stop. <laughs> Yellow, the amber says uh, get ready, green says go. So basically, it, it, these are things that from infancy were designed to drive home that message, mm. to raise our awareness. So at the, at, as, as you grow on, when you want to cross the road, there's, there's, there's this consciousness, look left, right, look right left and again. look again. And then you get a traffic light, even though when some of us were much younger, traffic lights were non-existent, but we already knew these things. So the repetition is one of the things why you have to have persons who are fixed in the field, who can spot the hazards, spot the needs, 
and know how to drive the message. It's like a gospel. You must have ministers. You must have evangelizers that go out to preach that message. So it, it's constant with us, and we can begin to adapt our behaviors to these changes. And these are the things that drive home safety culture. Yeah, okay, Nigeria as a nation, 59, where are we as regards safety? Because maybe we should be thinking more of, uh, maybe we should start getting many stuff safety or something right? <laughs> okay, well, so, where are we in, in so terms of safety it's 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 not very that question is not it's not very straightforward but we're doing well that much i can say uh, we have eastbourne now that is eastbourne is the regulator of safety in nigeria based on the eastbourne act so there's that uh, however we we realize that the major challenge i think for my personal experience is we still battle with a bit of negligence a lot of people are still covered by the blood or religious mantra that nothing will happen. We've been doing these things for so long, mm. so there's no need. So it's mostly companies or bodies that have foreign experience that often that buy better into safety because they realize that things can go wrong in the blink of an eye. And then it's part of their company policy as well that these things must be, must be in place. You must have a HSC department, you must have a safety pro, uh, manager, you must have a certain training, uh, trained personnel in a certain area for a number of staff. Whereas for the most part to some other persons, some other companies that are more domestic do not have that consciousness or just feel anybody can do it as far as we have common sense. We can get these things on. So I think those are the major challenges. Otherwise, we have a body, like I said, Eastbourne, that is domiciled. It's, it's in the law right now that Eastbourne should regulate these things. The Ministry of Labor also has, uh, is playing its role in ensuring that these things happen. But again, we need more safety professionals. We need to partner with the educational sector. We need to ensure that parts of safety uh, education is built into our curriculum. Because I think it does a great deal if at maybe secondary school level we can have some elements of safety. The same way we used to have a physical and health education, we can have some elements of safety education to uh, built into our curriculum such that children from nursery, primary and even secondary school yeah. can begin to change certain areas, certain mentality that they have and do things more safely. Because as I mentioned to you now, a lot of persons will not even have known that if you're going to lift, you should lift close to your body and not so far away. Mm -hmm. You should also realize, for instance, fire safety. A lot of persons do not even realize they need to have fire extinguishers. A lot of people do not even realize that there are different types of fire extinguishers. A lot of people do not even realize that when you want to even deploy a fire extinguisher, you should, do, you should check for where the wind is. So there are certain little 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 details that we could we could be learning as a people as against consciousness too then also if you look at uh, partnerships with other areas is building building codes that also need to be adjusted it needs to be driven down home safely you find certain houses they have only one entrance or one access if you check most of our uh, our big corporate buildings these days they have fire exits quite quite well but did not realize that fire exit ought to open out, not open in. I've been in certain banks where the fire exits open in. They don't open out. So these are very, very little details that also need to be. So basically, it mm. means it, we have a lot of work to do. I'm, I'm not going to dispute that as safety professionals. We need to continue to drive home these messages. But again, the people need to be aware that we are doing these things for their safety. Safety is everybody's business. So it's one thing when a safety professional is telling you that these things are necessary. It's another thing if you are even listening to what it is that you're being told. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm going to ask you all this question. Um, we're talking about safety. We're talking about well-being for our nation to be um, healthier and safer. And I'm just going to ask... How often do you go for a medical checkup, like a full body scan, and you want to check if your cholesterol level is okay, your blood pressure is fine, and you're not just covering it all up with the blood of Jesus and <laughs> all of this stuff. But seriously, safety is a big deal, and we all need to start giving it serious um, attention. Okay, still talking about safety in the workplace. Um, you know, you said something about 
the way we do things. We just keep doing it like that because it hasn't yielded, it hasn't resulted yeah, to anything yeah, negative. Yeah, exactly. And we just, I, I've been doing this for years. So, so what's it going to happen? Right, it's going to change now. So we have that as it was in the beginning, mm -hmm. so it will be forever attitude in Nigeria. But how do we now introduce safety in the workplace and make it palatable? It's a lot of work to change from the usual, mm -hmm. and safety is not really an easy business. If, if, if I'm going to look at it the way it's done, so how do you make it palatable and welcoming that everybody wants to embrace it? Okay, great. It's, there's, there's, there's many rules to this question. There's many approaches to it, and different safety bodies have different approaches to these things. One of the most direct rules to it is training. So um, it's for those at the helm of affairs to even realize that there's a need for this shift. Because if I go to a person and says, and I tell the person I want to train you in safety, a lot of persons may not, if you don't find, if you don't find that as necessary, you may not buy into what, even if I'm going to train you for free. Mm. So the most direct approach to it is training. So for the most part, there's uh, free trainings that come about. For instance, I'm here on television right now and I'm talking about safety. So I expect that at the end of the day, one or two persons will awaken that consciousness in them and realize that there's a need to do something about it. That's on the one hand. Then there's also advocacy that we do. Uh, for, for my company that I represent, we do a lot of advocacy and all of those things. And I know a lot of other bodies who have similar programs. Uh, affiliations, I have affiliations with World Safety Organization, and I know that they have a program they call Safe, SAFER, where they invest persons who are already doing great things in advancing the safety culture and safety message across various spheres of life, and then induct them as ambassadors so that they can support programs that increase the visibility of safe, safety in Nigeria. So that's another approach that they do, and there's a lot of other bodies that do the same thing. So the idea is, Advocacy is one thing, reception is another. So we cannot, we cannot undermine the role advocacy plays because we need to first raise that awareness that there's something before we can start talking about actionable plans that people need to make. So but ultimately, we need to let people realize. Then again, persons who have not been affected by hazards, persons who have not been negatively impacted by negligence do not really see the need for safety. For instance, a person who has had a generator placed at uh, the precarious location will not think that there's anything wrong with it until maybe they see a news report saying some persons were died as a result of carbon monoxide poisoning and then realize, okay, how, how safe is my generator at this point? And then again, you still have persons who, no matter what you do, will not listen. So that's yet again another thing. You were talking just now about um, health and care. A lot of people do not realize that certain, certain things that they do at work may be causing them hazards. I, I know someone who's currently working on a research that is testing the hazards that spray painting, for instance, does on uh, uh, the painters. The painter. Yes. So you're doing spray painting, and it's, it's a commendable job. It's something that people do commonly. You know, a lot of persons are patronized, but do these persons realize they need to wear safety um, gear, okay. wear their mask and all of those things? So these are things that you need to drive on to conscious, to conscious levels, not just waiting for boardrooms or corporate trainings and all of those things. Okay. All right. So um, I want to talk about violence on our streets. Mm -hmm. um, the increase in jungle justice, then there's... Um, physical security, that part of it is also something alarming. If I can just break out and before you know it, someone is knocked down and you also hear cases of um, the police trying to um, ask for money or maybe they were trying to break a fight and eventually there's a stray bullet, they call it accidental discharge and all of those stuff. But our streets are not really as safe as I think they should be. So, um, the question I'm asking is on firearms, your personal opinion in this. Okay. So many have said Nigeria should introduce a firearm law that allows okay. everybody to carry arms to defend themselves. So if okay. a thief breaks into your house with a gun, it's best to shoot. So that <laughs> oppression of don't, don't raise your hands or yeah, lie yeah. down flat will be reduced. Mm -hmm. But what do you think about this? Um, cause for us, since it seems like our security operatives are not doing enough, so in a bid to protect ourselves, okay. should we introduce a free use of firearms? Let, let, me, let me start by saying this. There's Q 
HSSE, Quality Health, Safety, Security, Education. Okay. Now, what that means is there's security in the practice, there's health, there's safety, there's, of course, environment, and then there's Education. quality. Now, the idea is security is, 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 is a component of safety. That's why the persons in law enforcement say safe and secure. Now, I want to cite the American example, which is, of course, where I'm going to make this my personal opinion as a safety ex expert. America, to, right now, as you and I speak, still has some issues with gun laws, gun violence, and that is the most armed nation in the world. America has more guns than people so, so far. Now, they have gun law issues, safety, gun safety issues. Now, Nigeria, right now, the law allows for certain levels of firearms. We, our laws do not allow for concealable weapons. So, which means you have to have certain levels of permits and yada, yada, yada. Now, that's on the one hand. If you are asking as to why, whether persons should be allowed to have more guns, the question I would ask is, are you going to educate persons on safety for these guns? Because right now we are looking at safety for other areas, for regular areas, realizing that your exit has to be a certain way, realizing that when the building gets to a certain level, you, ought, you cannot use just staircase anymore. You need to have escalators and elevators and all of those things. And we still have issues with um, electrical installation, standardization, and all of those things. So if people are not aware that there are codes and standards to these things that, in, that can affect their safety, I'm not very sure as a safety professional that if you say more persons should have guns, we'll be able to regulate effectively the safety, the safe use of these weapons. So that's my, that's my concern. So instead of recommending that persons have, uh, have access to more guns, I think what I would uh, focus on doing is looking at how we can equip our policemen better, how we can make our environment safer. For instance, yeah, you have the, the street properly lit with street lights. I think in some communities they have solar street lights. Mm. So we cannot even be talking about electric supply, whether there was light supply from BDC or not. So that would not be the issue. So if we have, because the, the lighting up of the area is a safety matter. So if for those in security experts, they will tell you that you should have lights outside. So that's on the one thing, on the one hand. Then there are also close communities, gated communities that have security guards as uh, neighborhood watch and all yeah. of those things. That's a, yet again another approach to securing lives and property in this, in this instance. These days there are persons who now use certain kind of uh, uh, barbed wire, electric fencing, perimeter security, CCTV and all of those things. These are other S uh, angles that could be employed to safety and security of property before we now start talking about when they are already in your premises. We, and then again, sometimes if they are already in your premise, I think one of the first things, from my own personal experience still, is they are going to be asking if you have a, a gun. Yeah. So and then again, if it becomes a, a shootout, that's another matter. Because if they are aware that you have a gun in your premises, I'm sure they will also go prepared for that eventuality. So. I, I think we should be looking at equipping our security forces better and then also looking at how we can make the environment easier for them to police and guard. Okay. Now we're talking about cultivating safety culture for nation building. Nigeria at 59. How safe are we? We'll go on a break on this show. When we come back, we'll talk about food and water safety because we know we have Ward D for Water International Day Against Open Defecation and all the many international days and we don't need to wait for those days to talk about those things. We eat every day. You drink water, except of course when you're fasting. <laughs> and even that fast, you still will break it now. Even if you decide not to move around your streets for uh, five days and you're locking yourself indoor, there's still safety in the house. Okay, you're not even moving, you just stay there. You still have to eat and drink water. So we need to t um, talk a little bit about food and water safety, but we're going to break. When we come back from that break, we'll address that part of safety issues. We'll be back. <laughs> 